Hi, everybody. I'm glad you're here, and I do think there are a couple of chairs along the side here. If you guys want to sit, you're more than welcome to. It's really nice to see everybody. I, and there's two more chairs here, too. Um, thank you for coming. I wish we had a proper auditorium to do this in, but it's kind of nice to do it in the space of the artwork. Um, my name's Kristen Poole, and I'm the former artistic director of the Sun Valley Museum of Art and had the great pleasure of being the co-curator of this exhibition with my colleague, Courtney Gilbert, who is the, cur the chief curator here at the museum. Um, this exhibition is also a big idea, and what that means for us at the Sun Valley Museum of Art is that in addition to a visual arts exhibition, there are whole lots of, um, a whole lot of other programs associated with the exhibition, a whole number of lectures and panel discussions that will explore dams and the role that they play um, both locally and globally. So please take in a brochure. They're, they're right at the front desk on your way out. and. Um, circle some dates on your calendar, the most pressing of which is next Wednesday, which is two days from now. Um, David James Duncan will be speaking in Forest Service Park um, and has specifically designed a talk for this exhibition around the issue of dams and um, fish in the Northwest. Many of you know him for the amazing book that he wrote called The River Why. So join us um, on Wednesday for that. You can get tickets at our website. The exhibition, um, like many, uh, is an endeavor over many years, and um, this one is, is, has actually been gestating for even longer than that. All four of the artists in this exhibition were commissioned to do original work for the exhibition, specifically around this place and the issue of dams at this moment in the 21st century. That is a rare privilege of an institution to be able to commission that kind of work from nationally and internationally known artists as well as local artists. And it takes time and energy and also resources and I'm enormously grateful for our members who stick with us, who show up, who participate and who support us throughout the year. For this exhibition we also had generous support from three patrons, um, Jerry Wolfson and the Wolfson Family Foundation, the Robert Lehman Foundation out of New York City and Jane P. Watkins. Um, <laughs> We truly, truly, truly can't do it without their support. And I'm also really indebted to Jane because it is through Jane that we got to have Jock here. Jock, Jock was convinced to come to catch him because Jane told him it was a good idea. So <laughs> um, we're really glad about that. It, it, is, it was and it is a good idea. Um, James Prosek is one of the four artists in this exhibition and we are honored um, that he agreed to participate. He came last summer. James is many things. He is an artist and a naturalist and a writer and has shown all over um, the United States and Europe. Um, there is a long list of exhibitions and museums that he has shown in and I'm not going to take the time today to go through them. He is also a writer and his works have been in the New York Times and many, many other publications. He is um, prolific and thoughtful and precise and playful, and you will hear all of that tonight, I believe. Jock Reynolds um, is a hero of mine. He is somebody who I have followed as a curator from a young age, and um, his history is also long, um, and, but most recently he was the director, uh, the Henry Heinz, uh, the second director at Yale University Art Gallery for many, many years. He is also a writer and an artist, um, and we are beyond delighted to have them both here tonight. We will do a brief Q&A if they don't talk too long, um, so form your questions as, as you are listening. And thank you all for being here. Please join me in welcoming Jack and James. Thank Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristen. I just want to say on behalf of James and myself that we are indebted to the wonderful hospitality your staff has shown us since James arrived with all the stuff in a van and installed it in a matter of about three and a half days. It was a hall, and all of these uh, silhouettes were hand-painted in by volunteer members of this community came in and installed the show with Jane. So it's been a tremendous team effort. We're very proud of what you've achieved for all four of these artists, and it's a great pleasure for me to be here with two dear friends of mine, James Prozek and, and Jane Watkins. We've known each other for now 
God, 25 years or something like that. I first met James when he was a student at Yale, and by the end of his sophomore year, he was all ready to publish his first trout book as a sophomore in college, if you can believe that. Mm -hmm. And Jane and I have been doing major photographic and book projects uh, ever since we first met and worked with Emmett Gowan on Changing the Earth, a wonderful project. And at the end of this talk, you're going to hear about something else that Jane, myself, and Oh, and James and many other artists are going to be involved with out in California that has to do with Yosemite. So uh, we're going to get it going now. And James is going to talk, and I'm going to prod him with different questions. <laughs> with a comments. cattle prod? <laughs> no, no, no cattle prod. <laughs> but the, the thing of dams, we're going to start out talking about our own relationship personally to dams and water. So I'm going to let James tee it off. Go right ahead, James. Thank you, Jock. Um, it's an immense pleasure to be here, and as Jock said, everybody here has been so good to us during our visit, and I could name a lot of names, and I'll name a few at the end, but I did have um, a lot of help painting this mural over three days um, from some very talented local artists and creative people. Um, I guess I'll just, at the beginning, I'll thank Kristen Poole and Courtney Gilbert, who really are the ones that that brought me into work here. And uh, I'll, I'll say a few more names at the end, but Jane is also one of them. And Jerry, thank you. Um, Catherine, <laughs> there's a lot. But, but Jane, uh, Jane and Jerry, thank you for helping make this happen. Um, yeah, so I grew up in southwestern Connecticut in a town called Easton. I actually live two houses away from the house where I grew up, so I have a very strong sense of place. And um, as a kid, I fell in love with nature through my father's love of birds initially. My dad grew up in Brazil, and when he moved here as a child, a 12-year-old, he brought that love of birds with him and, um, you know, started teaching me the names of the local trees and, and plants and flowers and birds. and. Um, for some reason, around the age of nine, uh, a fellow nine-year-old introduced me to fishing, and I fell in love with fish. And uh, I can't really say why, but it became kind of beyond a passion. It was more like a fanaticism or something. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it, it coincided with some turbulence in my home life. My mother had left home, and fishing... I think I went deeper into nature and, and into personal relationships with non-human animals. Maybe helped me cross some boundaries a little bit because I spent a lot of time on the stream and standing in the stream. And as you know, you know the, the, the stream is kind of an immortal entity, so you sort of become part of it when you're standing in it and see your reflection. And, and in terms of crossing boundaries, the the, the surface of this, the water is also something that was very alluring and that you could sort of pull something out from underneath. So I'm, I'm, why I'm very were, why wordy. Were, why, were you, why were you trespassing at a young age? What? Well, so uh, I grew up, <laughs> I grew up next to this drinking water reservoir and there were these no trespassing signs. Can you go back just the other one quickly? And I'll move a little more quickly now. But um, I remember when they changed these signs about 30 years ago, the old ones said no no um, hunting, trapping, or fishing. The new one said no hunting, swimming, or fishing, because people didn't know what trapping was anymore. But in my inquiry about boundaries, which includes dams, um, this tree and sign kind of illustrate the things I've been trying to articulate in my writing and, and artwork better than I think I can. Humans impose boundaries on the landscape, and nature ultimately takes them back. The trees growing around the sign, growing up, this was the best place to fish because for a nine-year-old, a no trespassing sign is like a welcome here sign. So <laughs> it was our own private Idaho. Um, and then even more boundaries, the tree is eating down here. I don't know if you can see, but there's a barbed wire fence. It's grown around and sort of torn apart. So I just love this idea, the resilience of nature. So this is where I grew up in this town, Easton, which is north of the, the biggest city in, Bridgeport, in, in Connecticut called Bridgeport. And in the 19, early 1900s, actually starting in the late 19th century, a few of Bridgeport's leaders, um, led by P.T. Barnum, who was the mayor and the president and owner of the water company, the Bridgeport Hydraulic Company, 
Um, so it was a little bit corrupt. They had a lot of friends in town, and <laughs> they decided because Bridgeport was this booming city that they would need a lot of drinking water. So they took through eminent dom domain a few river valleys, and they dam them, and my home is right next to the dam on the eastern reservoir. And they also preserved a lot of watershed land to naturally filter the water. So in my, in my valley here, there were 28 farming families that had to move out because of eminent domain. But actually for me it was not a bad thing because I grew up next to this, you know, several thousand acre preserve about an hour from New York City. So, so, it's, it's so what happened to you when you were caught trespassing and fishing? Well, I did get caught fishing by a game warden. Incidentally, Jock was a game warden on a California reservoir. <laughs> but I'll get to that next. And I wrote a book about my friendship with this, um, this, this, uh, this game warden named Joe Haynes, who caught me fishing legally, who became an important mentor of mine. And incidentally, Jock is also a hero and, and a mentor and friend of mine. So, um, and, and he also likes to fish. <laughs> But this is just a view of where I live on this farm and the dam. And, and this was actually part of the land that the water company wanted to take through eminent domain. But the old farmer was stubborn and they, they finally kind of let it go. Because in order to get into town, because the reservoir trapped this piece of town and, and cut off the road that went into town, they had to go through three other towns to get back into the, the center of Easton. So there were fights with the water company and Barnum was leading all that. It's, it's an interesting history. So, so here now is a little bit of my youth. As a young guy growing up on the UC Davis campus, and uh, I was told about a new college opportunity at UC Santa Cruz, where the Ansel Adam had taken pictures of the great Cowell Ranch and encouraged them to locate the new campus, not in Saratoga, but in Santa Cruz. And so I went there in 1965. We lived eight to a trailer because they hadn't finished the dorms and the new colleges up in the, uh, in the Redwoods yet. And very soon I started to spend a lot more time in the backwoods of uh, the campus and eventually applied for a job as a warden of the Loch Lomond Reservoir. Now this was a reservoir that was originally Newell Creek and it was dammed in 1960. And by 1963, it finally had enough water that it, w it w started to provide water for the city of Santa Cruz. And similar to what James said, they took over forest land, which originally had been some of the largest old growth redwoods in the whole area. And my job was, along with my roommate, we were both river wardens, I mean uh, reservoir wardens, was to welcome people at the very part of the first part, you could come in and fish and you could have little electric motorboats, but there was four, that's four miles to the end of that, and he, we had to walk the whole perimeter of it just to make sure nothing was polluting anything. And down at that very far end, the stumps from the original redwoods, I thought this was all, you know, Santa Cruz's campus was all old, old redwoods. It was nothing compared to the 12 foot, 16 foot in diameter old growth redwood that had been logged out of that part of the country. So that's when I first started to think about the history of, of conservation and, and water and wood use and things like that and carried on from there now. This was another thing that was very big in my life because my family was very involved with the Sierra Club and some of you may know that the Sierra Club was very involved in protesting the Raker Act which allowed the other great valley of Yosemite to be dammed to create a great big reservoir which is almost, what, 34 miles long that dammed the Tuolumne River to provide water for San Francisco, which it does to this day. But this was the second great valley of Yosemite, and John Muir put up the biggest fight he possibly could, but eventually lost it as the head of the Sierra Club. And to the day, this is how the, the reservoir looks. This was um, how it is now at the uh, edge of the dam, looking up there. I was up there last summer with my family, and we hiked all across the bridge through the, tu the tunnel, all the way along the five miles to the Wampana Falls. These are huge falls that supply water to the reservoir, as does the Tuolumne River. But this is what it looked like last summer. The water coming out of the, this is the same, if you compare, see that's the same rock formation 
when we got there, there was hardly any water coming in. We were having major problems with water and forest fires in California, as some of you in the audience know. Now we're gonna jump back to this passion James and I have, since you've seen some of how we got involved in issues of dams and water. Uh, it runs deep with us, but we're also great fly fishermen. We love catching and releasing <laughs> trout, steelhead, salmon. So James, talk about this first book you did and how you started this, and maybe even say something about how you as a very young student brought a certain great woman angler to Yale to give one of the best talks we've ever had for the fishing Who was club. That, Joan? Yes. Oh. Yeah, well, I... <laughs> you got to prompt this guy, you know? <laughs> well, I, I mean, it, while I was an undergraduate, I, because I love fishing, I tried to integrate fishing into everything I did. As an English major, I wrote my senior thesis on Isaac Walton and the Complete Angler, and I'd gotten to know Joan Wolfe a little bit, who's a well-known fly fisherwoman, and Lee, her husband, had died and helped orchestrate the bringing of his papers to the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library. There's a lot of other stories, but <laughs> I, do, I do love trout, and um, I guess my, my passion for trout started around when I started fishing, as I was talking about. And at nine or 10 years old, I went, my father used to take me to the local library. This was before the internet. <laughs> People remember libraries, I think. There's a good one here in town. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I couldn't find a book on the trout of North America, so I thought, at 10 years old, I'll put together a book on the trout of North America. So I started writing letters to departments of wildlife around the country, including Idaho, received very nice letters from biologists who'd studied particular types of trout their whole lives, and started to put together a list of all the fish I wanted to paint and started painting them. But I hit this kind of interesting obstacle where no two biologists that I talked to could agree on how many species of trout there were. And not only could they not agree on what was a species or a subspecies, they couldn't agree on the definition of what a species even was. And I, I learned very early on, I, I'd fallen in love with these field guides where you have all the birds, you know, ordered perfectly on the page and then the names across. I thought nature had been figured out and ordered by the authority figures. Um, but as it turns out, nature is messy and multifarious and constantly changing and evolves on a continuum. And it's not always that easy to draw lines between things and put labels on them. So I, I became very interested in the history of classification and naming and realized, and this goes back to dams and boundaries, that in order to communicate through language, we have to take what's essentially a holistic, interconnected world, a continuum or a spectrum, and draw lines between things and label them. And we essentially live through a kind of a fragmented world, or we, we receive and, and, and disseminate knowledge in this way. Um, and we, we kind of, including myself, um, and a lot of my work is about reminding myself not to live so much in the map or the tools that we use to navigate the world, that the actual land and nature is something different. So, so, I, so James, I want to talk about uh, something you did. You know, Magellan went all the way around the world. <laughs> this guy circum circumvent the whole world on the latitude in which he lived in Connecticut. So talk about that well, and what you trout, discovered on trout the Trout and salmon-related species only live in the northern hemisphere, so one of my several boondoggles was, actually it was the idea of my editor at HarperCollins to travel. He said, why don't you travel latitude line around the world fishing? And I thought, oh, okay, that's, I was 22 or something. <laughs> and, and my literary agent, this woman, Elaine Markson at the time said, well, why don't you travel the latitude line of your home? Then you're leaving in a straight line from home and heading toward home at the same time. And it, it's more interesting as a story. So I did that and, it, it, a, a, and a byproduct of that those Travels was a book on the trout of Europe, Asia, and North Africa, because I spent seven years traveling. This is in southeastern Turkey in the Euphrates headwaters. Um, this is in the headwaters of the Tigris River, about 30 kilometers from Iraq. Some of the areas were politically turbulent. The Balkans, there were still people fighting there, but the Balkans are like the Africa for brown trout diversity. They, they have incredibly beautiful spring-fed streams and some very, very interesting trout. This is a trout from the headwaters of the Tigris. Um, this looks like it's an amalgam of some different species, well, is it? Well, uh, the Tigris, I could give a whole lecture on the Tigris trout. Yeah. <laughs> trout, trout, uh, trout colonized 
um, rivers from the oceans originally, and the Tigris and Euphrates go to the Persian Gulf, which was always too warm for salmonid fishes, even, even during glacial periods when maybe things were a little cooler. Um, so the trout in the head was a Tigris actually um, traveled over mountain passes from the Caspian drainage, the Mediterranean drainage, and the um, Black Sea drainage, because in, in the headwaters between mountain passes uh, of these streams, the headwaters become very, come very close to each other, and trout can actually swim over wet meadows through, you know, when there's snow melt or during, during the ends of previous glaciations. That's how trout, for instance, from the Pacific, crossed from the Pacific side of the divide to the Atlantic side of the Continental Divide and live in places like Yellowstone, which is, goes into the Missouri and the Mississippi, yeah. into the Atlantic drainage. So, so trout evolution is kind of interesting. Um, you wouldn't think a fish could cross a mountain pass without help of some other creature, but they and, can. And where did you catch these? These are, these are from Hokkaido, northern Japan, so, which is on the 41st parallel. <laughs> but they look like our little brook trout at home. Um, it's a Mongolian rental car. <laughs> uh, <laughs> incidentally, in, ter in terms of boundaries, when I was there in 1998 looking for these rare grayling and, and lenuk and huchin fishes, there's almost no roads. The drive would just, we'd point on the map where we wanted to go and they would just drive over the, the landscape, which was kind of cool. And this is a Mongolian boy holding a, an Arctic grayling, just to show that Fishing and living on rivers and depending on rivers is, is obviously universal around the world. And even if we didn't speak the local language, we, we could, in a sense, communicate with people. We did learn the local word for trout in most places. In Turkish, it's alabalik, which we had to say a lot to the Turkish police that were searching our car. Why are you here, alabalik? They're like, alabalik. <laughs> um, so if we learned the word for trout and the word for beer, we, we were pretty happy. <laughs> Oh, well, now where did we Sorry. get to this? <laughs> well, I just wanted to kind of bring home the idea of, you know, when in the Bible, God's first task for humans is to put names on the animals, Adam's first task. And in a sense, God creates the world by, through separation. He divides light from darkness, air from water, takes a piece of clay from the ground, makes humans, hands the, then he hands the, task of sort of fragmenting the rest of the world to, to Adam by, through naming, which is, creates this divide between us and them. And one of my favorite naming stories is this, this story by Ursula Le Guin called She Unnames Them, where Eve goes through the garden unnaming all the creatures. And when she's done, she hands her own name back to Adam and walks out of the garden in protest. Because naming is a form of possession and control, and it's a, it's a great little feminist. It was a one-page story in the New Yorker in Women, women are, have something to say about this issue right now, about controlling well, she, their She own. thought that if the animals were going to have names, that they should give them to each other. But So what have um, we here, James? Well, this is just another James piece where, you know, trying to communicate how humans like neatness and order and control when really we're, we're constantly trying to create this illusion of permanence um, in a constantly changing planet. And um, dams are part of that control, as are fences and, and border walls and, and lines and roads and highways. And uh, I'll just briefly touch on two, two projects that I did that are about dams and migration. I, I spent 12 years writing a book about freshwater eels that have the opposite migration of salmon, which is ultimately the, the fish that this exhibition sort of centers around. <laughs> the, the eels spawn in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean but live their adult lives in, in freshwater. So they're a catadromous fish opposed, as opposed to salmon and trout, which are anadromous fish. And, and you track them from Maine to uh, New Zealand, is that correct? Well, there, there are several species of, of eels around the world that make these migrations, and, and the biggest one lives in New Zealand, and the Maori, the, the, the native Polynesians, the eel's one of the most important fish in their culture, so about a third of the book is about Maori culture. But this is when they first come into fresh water from the ocean, and these things are born and kind of drift, they have to fight against the, the Gulf Stream, otherwise they'd end up in Murmansk. So it's just remarkable that they know where to go. They're orphaned, born as these orphaned fish in the middle of the Atlantic, the, the adults are dead and they find their way back, to, they find their way to the coast. And when they first enter freshwater, they're transparent, they call them glass eels. 
And then they become pigmented um, and start to look more like adult eels. Um, next. And obviously okay. dams are, for, for salmon, a lot of the problem is going upstream. For eels, which are really adept at climbing, if there's, a, if there's like a little wet stream of water, they can actually climb over a dam or through a pipe or, or they provide little areas that they can get over. It's really the downstream after spending 30 to 60 years in fresh water. In the case of New Zealand eels, up to over 100 years they've aged these big female eels. Um, this was an etching from the book of a, a Francis Turbine. They go through the, the penstock tube through the hydroelectric dam into the turbines and they get chopped up um, or nicked. So this is an eel that, that got um, chopped up in a, a dam in Maine. And this is a turbine in New Zealand that actually stopped because so many eels. I know it's a gruesome image, but it's a, it's a sad and the power goes out sometimes when the eels are migrating, or that used to. Um, next slide. So you can see this is the historic range of the freshwater eel, and then because of dams, they just can't, they can't reach all their historic habitat, so the population has declined, among other things like climate change and things that affect everything. Um, another boundary that I spent time thinking about uh, through an exhibition I did at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West in Cody, which I think is where Kristen and Courtney first learned about my work uh, is the, the boundary around Yellowstone National Park, which is not marked by a fence or a dam or any physical boundary, but it's a conceptual boundary on the map, which was drawn by Ferdinand Hayden in 1862 or 72 to protect the thermal features on the largest volcano in the world. But, but even invisible boundaries, which was the name of the exhibition, can affect the fates of animals. So in, inside the park, an elk might be protected once it leaves um, it can be, you know, killed as a trophy animal. The animals don't know the lines are there because they can't see them, but they affect. So it's just an illustration of how conceptual lines between named units or, or a boundary on a map that's not visible on the ground. So my friend Arthur Middleton, who's a professor at UC Berkeley, studies these elk migrations that radiate out of the park. There's six or seven main herds, and um, they end up mostly in other public lands and private lands. So in order to successfully do conservation work, you have to get to know some of the landowners who own some significantly huge ranches. Pitchfork Ranch, the Cody herd spends most of it, 7,000 animals, spends the winter in two ranches, Pitchfork and, and Hoodoo Ranch, which were each about 250,000 acres. So it's not, a, not trivial. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is just another picture of the greater Yellowstone, which there is a lot of public land uh, immediately outside the boundary of the park. Um, typically with pronghorn, they, the lower rung of the fences are supposed to be barbed, unbarbed because they don't jump over fences like deer do, they go under. So um, this is a photograph by my friend Joe Reese, who was part of the exhibition. He shoots for National Geographic. And, um, he got this unfortunate image of a pronghorn with his foot caught. Um, and this is a little watercolor I did of Lower Falls of Yellowstone, which is... This is right over here in the in show. The, just to illustrate that there are natural barriers, too. Historically, trout would not have been able to get above this falls because they originally, uh, they originally um, colonized rivers from the ocean. And, and every 20 to 30,000 years is a glaciation, which basically freezes the whole range of these fish and they have to migrate to the ocean or perish. There are a few places, relict populations, where they can survive through glacial periods, but typically that's, that's why salmon and trout still have migratory instincts because they, they had to leave um, because of the ice. Now this I want to say is, I've gotten to know do James. A time check. <laughs> no, we're doing okay on time, I think. I think so. James, the very last artist in residency I sponsored at the Yale Art Gallery was one we expanded to include the Peabody Museum and the Beinecke Library, where James had already proven that he could cross different institutional lines in a wonderful way. And I said, James, why don't you come over and pick from all three of these institutions and with your sense of what you might like to juxtapose, have your way with us. So this is the cover of his uh, catalog. And, and Jock, as a di director of how many years at Yale? 20. 20-something 20 20. years. Um, 
made many attempts, which as people who work in universities know is not easy to work across departments because people are territorial and siloed. So making interdisciplinary kind of projects is, so, so Jock's idea of juxtaposing objects from the Natural History Museum, the Art, Art Museum and works of my own, we were able to, because the, um, the director of the Peabody was also amenable, do things like bring a skull of a Taurosaurus from the Peabody and put it next to Barbara Hepworth with a, a mural, you know, and there's a lot of reasons why um, we did certain juxtapositions, but um, one of them, this in this case, is almost purely visual. They just look cool together. <laughs> but um, well, don't forget that Hepworth and Henry Moore were very influenced by skulls and by bones. bones and everything. Yeah. I, that's who I was influenced as as a young sculptor studying at Santa Cruz was Henry Moore and Hepworth. Well, one of the main ideas behind this show is that evolution is a force that is creative. It makes things. It made mm -hmm. us and that force that made us made creatures that I think also embodied that urge to make things yeah. and to produce endless forms most beautiful as Darwin described it. Yeah. So art is just a manifestation. Art making to me uh, is an extension of that evolutionary urge and birds make things like nests, beavers make dams. Uh, Nature is very productive and we think art is very special. I don't think it's really that special. It's just another kind of manifestation. And we say art is made for art's sake. Some of these things might actually be useful one day. And who knows? Not this, but well, one <laughs> this of the <laughs> one of the largest collections of birds, stuffed birds, in the in the in all of America are held in the Peabody's collection, and we used to see them all in little cases. And so James proposed what you see on the wall, and believe it or not, they let him take all of these out and arrange them in this manner. Well, they have 150,000 specimens, and I've been spending time over the last 10 years as a curatorial affiliate at the museum, even going on collecting trips. I collected two of these specimens in Suriname and skinned them and prepared them myself. So this was about 250 birds pinned to the wall in a color spectrum, and there's Helen Frankenthaler, you know, juxtaposed with works that I thought might look good together, but Frankenthaler's work, you know, you have these beautiful stained colors that overlap with other colors and the boundaries are kind of blurred or early Rothko paintings like we had in the show or even Constable's cloud studies. But this, I wanted to do a spectrum of birds to kind of make this metaphorical connection between the color spectrum and the evolutionary continuum. They're both not easily divisible and, and the lines we draw on them are arbitrary. So in order to communicate the color spectrum, we have to we have to label different colors like red or orange or yellow, but really there's no, there's no place where red ends and orange begins. We have to draw those lines. And in fact, different cultures around the world divide and name the color spectrum differently. In the past, linguists thought that cultures with more color names meant that the people were able to see more colors, which of course is not correct because biologically humans are pretty much similar around the world. But it was just a fun thing to do also yeah. and visually interesting and, and some of the specimens are extinct like Carolina parakeet. This was actually my favorite bird when I was a kid, the cock of the rock and it <laughs> wasn't until I was in my 30s that I got to see them lecking in Ecuador but back to... Um, now, now we're back in this area around a dam that has been breached. Do you want to talk about that and then the next image after it is one created by an artist in the audience. Well, last, uh, last September when I visited, um, Courtney and Kristen were kind enough to introduce me to Bob Griswold and Laura McPhee, who are here tonight, and, and maybe Bob can answer some questions later better than we can about what's happening with dams in Idaho. But, but they brought me to Sunbeam Dam and, and told me the story about how it was built in 1910 by, I think, a single miner and, and for to run his, his mining operation and then was abandoned a couple of years later. And it's just a, a killing machine for no reason. So totally curtailed the, the run of the sockeye salmon needlessly. Um, but luckily in, I think, 1934, it was breached. Um, this is a photo of, of Laura's, um, of Sunbeam Dam uh, with the river going through it. So this is kind of a happy, maybe, story <laughs> and uplifting. So it was really special to go there with with both of them last year um, and very generous of them to take time to do that. Um, and Bob took me up to Fishhook Creek, is that that comes out of Redfish Lake and and there were landlocked sockeye salmon uh, spawning 
this uh, is a little video of the, <laughs> which is, uh, I don't know, if the dams ever do come down, um, it's possible that, that somewhere in the DNA of these landlocked fish, there's a migratory instinct and they could repopulate the Columbia Basin in a thousand years or 10,000 years. <laughs> no, James, but, here's another work that you made specifically for this exhibition. It's right over there on the wall. What do you yeah, want to I, say? Yeah, I, I just was thinking of how, can you go to the next one, uh, Jock, how to kind of conceptually promote ideas of, of fragmentation or and so I, I literally cut the fish in half and once we once we chop up nature we can control it in different ways so I not only cut it in half but I swapped the two but I painted this little elephant's head flower just to show that that juxtaposition was intentional um, but actually then Kristen's like well it actually looks like a continuum because they're like chasing each other so so fragment, there's a lot of ironies in separation and fragmentation. Even dams, which we think of as a bad thing, we're here gathered together talking about nature because of dams. And I'd like to think optimistically that in the future, beyond our lifespans, the dams will be gone and the fish will be coming back. And maybe they'll say, oh, these people used to talk about the dams. You know? <laughs> um, but maybe I'm being optimistic. But I, I also started fragmenting these different grasses and wildflowers. And, it, was, it actually started as a practical thing. I, didn't, I couldn't really carry um, big sheets of paper with me, so <laughs> and then I wanted to paint something that was bigger than I had paper for. And then I thought, well, thought, well wow, that kind of communicates um, how we fragment landscapes. I'm working on an exhibition at the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art in Fort Worth that's all about Texas prairies. And I'm doing a big grasses and wildflowers this way because the landscape there is fragmented you know, and there's only a few places where remnant prairies that haven't, pieces of land that haven't been plowed exist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and from the air, it's all, all the properties are just squares and boxes. And, and you paint all of these in situ with your... I do, if you go to the next Well, and we're going we're gonna to look at this image. Here he is out in the field. Well, Kristen and Courtney, when I first arrived last year, I think they had a lot of work to do. So they're like, oh, go for a hike. And they, <laughs> and they, they sent me up Summit Creek Trail, and, um, which I was grateful for. And, uh, and I found probably, well, there were a few paintbrush still blooming, even though it was early September. But I chose this specimen because... Now, let me say something yeah, about yeah. this specimen. What do you notice about this specimen? Anything unusual? Anyone want to say I anything? Anything at all? You see the center shaft of the plant? It's been cut off. So what, what's your explanation? Well, do you think? yeah, and if you go back to the previous one, you'll see that the actual specimen looked like that. But yeah. um, I, I like that flower particular individual because it had a story. Something obviously browsed it, maybe an elk, and then it bifurcated and grew in two directions. So. In the, in the prairies, grazing is a, is a, a force of, um, it's healthy for the prairies, as is burning, which is another kind of trauma, or seeming trauma, that actually promotes um, greater growth the following season. Um, but, you know, in the history of natural history painting, usually with botanical painting, the, the artists were looking for the perfect specimen, or trying to paint the ideal specimen, or for a field guide. I like looking for a specimen that has a little you know, holes in it that a bug ate, or because then it has the residue of that individual's plant's experience. And then I also like to paint the shadows next. Uh, the shadows kind of become something of the, themselves because it, it acknowledges that there's a light source beyond the edge of the page and that there's an ecosystem and, and, a, and, a, and a star that's actually giving life to everything in the world. When I painted all these trout as a kid, the last thing I would do was put a little white dot on the eye of the fish and it, it would just kind of jump off the page and I, I didn't really know what that was, what was creating that or thought about until I painted a life-size swordfish and I was standing over the swordfish on the deck Oops, of a boat and I, I saw my reflection, the swordfish's eye and the rigging of the boat over my shoulder and, I, and the sun and I was like, oh, that yeah. makes sense, it's the sun. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you were are, talking about burning, here's another piece that's in the show. And it's on a, looks like a burnt log, but what's really going on in this, this object? Did you make this? I did. I, I, um, there's a couple of them over there. <laughs> the, 
these burned logs that I had cast in bronze work with a foundry in New Jersey and um, you know, made them black with, with a chemical and, and rub bowling wax and graphite powder to make them look burny. Are these, then, are these real plants, or well, are these no, made the, from something? they're made of clay, and I, I've been learning for the last 15 years how to make these, these clay flowers from this woman from Thailand that I met. And, and I made these native flowers. This is called elephant's head flower. These, each one looks like a little elephant's head, and then there's two Indian paintbrush. <laughs> But no, they're, they're time consuming, but I, I, I just, it, there's also a, something about for me in my life as somebody who likes to draw, in the process of drawing something, trying to represent something in nature, I would relive the experience of being with that thing in a, in, in with fish in an almost like lucid dreaming kind of way. I was back on the stream, could smell the smells. And so I, I feel like there's a connection going back to cave drawings between humans trying to make representations of them and, and the process of making those representations helping make us better observers and feel more connected yeah, yeah, to yeah. nature. Now this use of the silhouettes which we see all around us is also <clears throat> in the painting that's just on the back side of that wall. And how many species did you represent in well, this painting? Well these are all Idaho uh, creatures, <laughs> but they're kind of clustered together I mean, there's a few things I'm trying to do, make something that I think might be visually interesting, but also communicate this interconnectedness of all the living things in an ecosystem. Um, and incidentally, the, the numbers, which, which I was gonna talk about when, yeah. when we um, went by the mural things, the, these murals are, are sort of inspired by these end papers and old field guides like Roger Torrey Peterson's Field Guide to the Birds where there's silhouettes of birds and numbers and the numbers match up to a list of names to help us learn how to identify them but I've become critical of us including me going out and just wanting to know the names of things and yeah. checking them off a list so there's no key of names so people can't s but yeah. I, taunt, I taunt people with the numbers. So. Hey, here's something you don't know, that a lot of the silhouette tr training happened out of the military. Peterson was a naval officer during World War II. They made silhouettes of all, all the ships, the enemy ships, and they made silhouettes of all the planes as a well, way it was to, also to identify them. For identification with birds and planes, it was about reducing the object or creature to its most essential characters and, and point to the diagnostic character that will allow you to identify this plane from that plane or yeah, that bird. Yeah. So it might be a little yellow patch. Over so that's a reductive process like languages. I'm trying to kind of expand that and show that every animal is an individual. It's just a different message, but I'm not, yeah. I love the field guides still. Now, how about this thing that's on the back wall of the building that... Uh, well, that's Kristen helping put it up. <laughs> well, let's, let's give Kristen another look then. Well, what, I, I, like, um, I've been thinking about the American flag. Obviously, a lot of artists have, have made interpretations of the American flag, but how it's really all about grids and boundaries and lines and, and protecting territory. And there's nothing organic. There's not really much organic on a lot of world flag, country flags. Mexico has an eagle and a, and a snake and a cactus, but... But ours doesn't have anything, so I, I chose a different animal for each of the 50 states. And, you know, we have the state animal of Idaho or, or whatever, and the eagle up in the top. And the animals are crossing the boundaries, which is what animals do. They migrate, they move, including humans, of course. Yeah, beautiful. So that's, a, that's another picture of it. Isn't I that great? I think Very that, nice. Now, here's something that I want to... Uh, <clears throat> talk about because this also includes another person that's been very active in the history of the the Sun Valley Center. You, you notice Mark Klett's name down there at the bottom with Rebecca Solnit and Byron Wolf. Mark has been involved in many of the re-photographic projects starting in the late 70s and he's kept alive the sense of going to places and juxtaposing some of the great pictures taken by Moybridge and Watkins and many other great photographers within Weston Adams and and uh, others, and, and producing these wonderful things that show you how things were and show you how things changed. And this Yosemite in Time is a wonderful book. Rebecca Solnit's become her book on uh, River of Shadows of Moybridge was nominated for the National Book Award. 
She's, she's a brilliant writer. And what my dear friend Jane has done, we, since we both went to UC colleges, we're gonna help students at UC Davis and Santa Cruz organize through their own research a major exhibition of Yosemite, its history, and its state now. And not just be the older people that know some of its history, but get them into active research so they see where this stuff is really sto stored. And <clears throat> one of the ways <clears throat> that I want to introduce students, because it's a place I spent a huge amount of my youth, is Tuolumne Meadows, where the Sierra Club was founded back in 1989 uh, by <clears throat> John Muir and others. And this is the Parsons uh, Lodge at, at the uh, old Sierra Club family campgrounds, which the club owned until 1978 when it was so active internationally they thought they should sell it, which they sold it to the park and, and stopped that. But in that building, since 1949, my family went every summer and camped there, and every night all the parents would come in and have a fire and talk about ecological issues, and we would read books on Shackleton and Annapurna and all kinds of things of the history of mountaineering. And this is a beautiful, uh, and this is the McCulley cabin where the caretakers of the Sierra Club uh, campground lived. And uh, Ann and Fred Eisler were the, the people who ran it during the whole time we were there. And this was their wonderful daughter, Muffy Eisler, who I got to know in 1956 when I was nine years old and she was four, no, five, and her sister, Julie, and uh, she would come out every morning in front of that cabin. Her mother would brush her hair and her sister's hair and then put it in pigtails. And when the pigtails were done, they were my summer sisters and off we'd go to play the whole. So every summer I saw her and she became the head park ranger for 35 years and just retired. And she's the one who started the Parsons Lodge series of lectures in nature, also music and poetry. And the person who preceded her is the longest serving park naturalist in America. This is Carl Sharsmith, who came to uh, California in 1930, studied at the, at the Yosemite School for Rangers, and the next year was hired in 1931, and he served till 1991, 60 years. And he was an incredible man. He and his wife were not only great Mountaineers, they cataloged and collected all the botanicals, the kinds of things that James draws, and put them in huge herb her collections at UC Berkeley and at San Jose State. Now those things are no longer fresh, they're all pressed and everything, but they basically created a category for all the alpine uh, flowers and plants, and many of them, as you know, only sometimes have a month or two months time to live, and boom, they're gone at the end of the summer at higher elevations. He took me and Margaret and others on our first nature hikes when we were six and eight, nine years old, and we until he retired and my friend took over. So that's a total of 95 years of continuity. Here I am at the, with the current ranger with my uh, fly rod and my old fish. My mother always made these. I always had to wear these red hats, these Vermont crushers, because my mother could always see me when I was out fishing in the morning and yell to come back in. And if you know Winslow Homer's watercolors or paintings, there's always a spot of red, if not more, and it just pops out. So I'm here with the current, the new ranger. And James came and I, I've invited Terry Tempest, Williams, James, many of the finest scholars and artists and poets and musicians have, have produced there. So James came and great, did a great talk there few years ago. <laughs> and uh, here he is inside the actual lodge being introduced. It's an audience a little bit larger than this. Only about 100 uh, people can fit in. And sometimes they just open the side windows and people sit in the window sills. What's well, kind of cool, too, because you and, can't drive to it. You have to hike in about a mile and a half to so, get to it. So the here's a young co-ed from my alma mater, UC Santa Cruz, which has had a 50-year association of students who come up and work in Yosemite. And many of them have become park rangers. And this is the current young lady who I just met uh, two weeks ago, sitting in one of the windowsills. What's happening? Now, I just want to end this by saying wonderful things sometimes happen 
when you're out in nature. Everyone in this room has had that experience of where you behold something special or something really unusual happens. And many of you in this audience I know have been growing plants that attract butterflies, be it monarchs, be it swallowtails, whatever. We have a bunch of them showing up in New Haven right now. And I had this experience three weeks ago when I was fishing on the lower fork of the Stanislav River and I had this very hat on. And all of a sudden, out of my peripheral vision, I saw this yellow showing up. I said, what the hell's going on? And I looked down there. A tiger swallow tail had landed on my hat. Now, do you notice, you remember how Jane's had that, that little flower that had something that happened to it? What happened to this swallow tail? That uh, lost the tails. These things only have a two-week living uh, lifetime, but clearly a bird had probably hit this, this swallowtail, took it off, and so she was crippled and landed on my hat and stayed with me for eight hours as I fished, <laughs> never left the hat. I, took, I hiked all the way back to camp, took it off. She stayed on it overnight, and I took her down to the river. I said, yeah, what do you want to do? <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. And she didn't want to go anywhere. So we have these magical experiences when we take ourselves out into the beautiful environment such as Sun Valley and places I've been just since I've been here for a couple of days. And we never want to lose those experiences. And we have the crises of, of uh, dams and things that make us discouraged, but we have moments of real wonder, don't we? And we want to perpetuate those for all the people to come. So we want to thank you for coming to this talk, and we're going to now open it up for some questions. Can I, can I just thank a, a few people who helped me? You on certainly the, can. Melanie, Laura, Ann, Riley. Who am I forgetting? Allison. <laughs> Any others? Well, it was, I'm grateful, and uh, thank you for letting us talk about our passions, which hopefully uh, I think you all share. So you can look forward to a couple of major exhibitions that will be sh shown at UC Davis and UC Santa Cruz on the, the history and current situation of, of Yosemite coming up. And this is something that Jane, this character James, myself, and many other artists and writers and environmentalists are going to be involved in. So I hope some of you will be able to come and see that at two universities. Thank you very much. Any questions? Don't be. No one I've met here so far has been shy. Was the reservoir? Is that the Hetch Hetchy? The Hetch Hetchy. Is that what the reservoir you're talking about? Yes, the Hetch Hetchy. Just so you know, my brother is very involved in wanting to undam the Hetch Hetchy. The water can be stored very safely going downriver, but the Raker Act is. I, I could go into a whole history of this. Because of the fire and the earthquake at, at San Francisco, there was great sympathy to keep helping San Francisco get back on its feet. And the water company that controlled most of the water coming to San Francisco was controlled by one company. And this is where John Muir had a party with his own board at the Sierra Club, because some of them were San Franciscans. They wanted the thing to be dammed, and it was dammed to provide that. And San Francisco's never wanted to give it up. There'll become a time when that dam will be either breached or they'll just let all the water out. And how wonderful it would be to see how that regrew over a hundred years. Because it's a magnificent, I've hiked it, it's a 40 mile hike from Glen Allen Trail on the Pacific Coast, the Pacific Crest Tail to come all the way down there. It's spectacularly beautiful, but hardly anyone goes there. It's very remote. So we'll, we'll do something, you know, though something's going to happen with that, just the way I'm sure you all heard the problem with the, the damming. And, and you may want to comment on what we just heard with Governor Inslee and, you know, what they, what they said coming out of Seattle about breaching dams versus what the Native American wants. Do you want to comment on that? Do you want to comment, comment Bob? Uh, no. <laughs> you, you're talking about the... Um, the proposal to yes. reach the Lower Snake Dam. So yeah, get salmon up there There's again. been some movement. The um, Senator uh, Simpson in Idaho um, proposed breaching and compensating um, for all the lost benefits there, you know, to the tune of $20, $30 million. Nobody could get behind that. And, and, but then uh, Governor Inslee and uh, 
and Senator Murray from Washington came up with their plan. They couldn't get behind Sen Senator Simpson's plan, but they came up with a plan to study the feasibility of how you would replace the benefits from the dam. Yeah. And what was it, uh, a couple, three days ago or something, they um, let everybody know that it wasn't, that, that we had to replace those benefits first and we were gonna work on it and yeah. Yeah. the dams needed to stay in place yeah. for now. Yeah. So that was kicking the can down the road. Yeah, well there's quite a bit of that going on, but things are start, people are more and more interested in seeing how some of these things might be resolved in a positive manner and that's, where I hope we can get beyond sheer politics and really have people conversing and what we can do together to keep the environment healthy and, and restore things that we would all love to see restored. Yeah, if, eventually they will come down they'll, if they have to fall down, but um, it, it, we are losing a lot of genetic diversity, yeah. which is only a problem in the short haul, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 years, as you said, after, you know, the next ice age, uh, it'll there'll be a reset anyways. Yeah. So. You know, one thing I think about, I don't know if you'd find this amusing, but when I spent quite a bit of time in Europe and, and went to school in Switzerland when I was younger, Europe, Europe, they treasure their castles. You visit all these castles on mountaintops everywhere, right? So why wouldn't it be interesting to, if, if let's say the Hetch Hetchy Dam doesn't need to be there anymore, you don't have to blow it up and erase it. Why not have that be a place where people come and study the edifice itself? I thought about this a lot when my wife and I commemorated the 100th anniversary of the Carnegie's first uh, steel mill and library in, uh, in the Three Rivers town of Pittsburgh. And what was happening, all these people from Europe were wanting to come over and see what those steel mills looked like, but we were just taking them all apart and melting them down. And get wanting, We want to get rid of things. We want to just erase things sometimes rather than let their history be visually evident and study it. Yeah. So anyway, oh, you have a question, please. But it, it's a curious question. Um, having been many times down the Middle Fork and various other rivers, uh, in particularly uh, with uh, Bob Seavey, um, who retired a few years ago, and as a river man, his comment was that he felt that the woods, the forests, around our valleys, around our rivers, are degrading because of, in part, because of the dams, because yeah. he saw this circle of life that the uh, fish come up to, to uh, spawn and die, and yeah. of course the bears feed on the fish, as yeah. do uh, the osprey and so forth, and they in turn drop off the remnants, and yes. this feeds the right. river, right. uh, the woods. Do you agree with that? This well, those, was his those, observation. Those minerals. <laughs> Salmon-bearing streams in Alaska. They say that just the, you know you fertilize fields with nitrogen and phosphorus typically in uh, modern agriculture. It, the the um, delivery of nitrogen and phosphorus uh, around salmon-bearing streams is equivalent to that. So yeah. think about the forest and then envision the fields down in southern Idaho with and without um, fertilizer applications. Yeah. I mean, that's what you're really um, talking about. The same thing is true in Davis, the great Yolo County, the Central Valley where I grew up. That used to just all flood down from the Sierra with all those nutrients. And then when we started to populate it, you know, they put in the causeways and the canals and all these things started to happen. In the town of Davis, you know how deep the, the uh, topsoil is at some points? 50 feet deep. That's how rich it was for the, what came in. And, and yet when all these people moved in, they had to create the, I remember this 56 Yuba City flood, it almost crested over the, the whole causeway and flooded everything. We were out there with sandbags, I remember as a kid, you know, nine years old saying, what's gonna happen? So, you know, there are these 100 year, 500 year events that can really shake things up. Just, just a quick eel story <laughs> um, about how the, the connectivity is lost when there are obstructions in the landscape. I mean, a dam is essentially like creating a, a state of cardiac arrest in the circulatory system. And the, the, in the east, the Delaware River and the Susquehanna are, are big rivers that flow to the Atlantic. And the Delaware is pretty much dam-free up to the Catskills, a pretty long way. And um, there's a, a healthy population of freshwater mussels, 
of, a, of the most common species, I think, I forget what kind, but, and the Susquehanna was virtually devoid of freshwater mussels, a, a, a river that has a lot of dams along the way. And, and some biologists studying mussels, typically, I think freshwater mussels attach themselves as larvae to the gills of migrating fish, and that's how they distribute themselves throughout the ecosystem. So, because eels couldn't get up the, the Susquehanna, and they could up the Delaware, and the eel was the primary host for the larva of these freshwater eels, fr freshwater mussels. Um, the delivery system for the mussel larva wasn't there, so the, the mussels that help filter the water and, and do other things that we don't even know about um, were absent. So without the eels, the mussels also disappear. So there's a lot of interconnectivity, as we know. One thing we didn't put into our talk, which bears mentioning, I'm sure you all are aware of it, you've seen Lake Mead and how low that is right now. But a lot of people don't know that both the Rio Grande River and the Colorado River in some places have literally reached the Gulf and the Pacific Ocean dry with no actual runoff. So how water's to be shared, not just between Native Americans who had to give up a lot of their rights, but if between states, who gets how much water? How much does Mexico is supposed to get a certain amount of water? These are big, complicated issues, but the problem is there's not enough water and it's being overused. And how are we going to how are we going to deal with it without really creating something very onerous, as, as you refer to? Yeah, I, go I ahead. Would, I would add to that just to think about a more local issue right here on the Snake River that. Um, Typically in the summertime, the highest flows on the Snake River, the highest flows on the Snake River are up by, um, are right below Anderson Dam. Yeah. And by the time it gets down to Milner Dam, the river is completely dewatered. Yeah. And then it recharges again when the springs come yeah. back in down yeah. below. But we've taken the entire Snake yeah. River uh, by, before you get to Twin Falls. Yeah. There were some other hands up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just wondered if there was actually a natural life to dams because of the silt and things coming, you know, up, down towards the dam, if they eventually silt up and, and can't really be used anymore. Yes, that does happen. Yeah. That's you it. know the the Loch Lomond <laughs> the Loch Lomond dam that I where I was the warden those those were those were those were uh, earthen dams those were not concrete dams, and you're right those those the pressure that builds up on them, and it's true of the levees in the whole Sacramento Valley. You know the levees have been burrowed into by all kinds of things. There a lot of them are very vulnerable to breaking out and and they could f flood. So there you know a lot of these things if they're not really maintained and and repaired. Uh, you know, they're going to be problematic at some point, sometimes disastrously so, sometimes not. Take that thing. Where is it? You're, it's on. Oh, Just, it's on? Okay. Right, hold it. You're okay. on stage. Am I? Yeah. Oh. I was going to ask, say something about eels. And you talked about them, but I only thought of eels as ooky until I read your book. So I, I really, there's two books out about eels. I really recommend reading his book. You will never feel so ooky ever again about eels. Not only that, it's on a PBS, there's a film, there's a video, you can get it as a film and it's fabulous. Yeah, just look it up. We'll sell some of his books and films here. You go. go ahead. Yeah, yeah. What are the big minds thinking about? Eliminate six billion people. 
No, no. Well, population growth has always been an issue. We keep growing it bigger and bigger. The other thing that worries me most is that we have not expurged this rampant nationalism that keeps, I mean, look at what Putin's doing. This is just insane, you know, invading Ukraine the way he is. But nations have got to learn somehow to quit misbehaving with one another if we're gonna, I think, have much success long run as a species. Now, how much we allocate and can do with less or more of certain things, there are a lot of really interesting people doing good research medically, agriculturally, and others on energy. I think, you know, I'm not, I'm not hopeless, but I worry about the, the world my grandchildren are gonna grow up in. I'm sure many of you feel the same way. We, anyone else want to say anything? Okay, you're, yeah. Speak up. In your life as a naturalist, what is the fish or plant or ecosystem you've never seen with your own eyes that you would most like to? <laughs> well, the ecosystem or place I'd like to see or experience most, hey, that's a tough one. Um, <clears throat> I've been getting pretty uh, deep into prairies. I. I'd like to, prairies, yeah, I mean, I've started now in Texas, and I'd like to, um, I'd like to be able to expand that project about Texas prairies at the Amon Carter to other parts of the Great Plains. I mean, I, I actually drove the work for this show out here in a van from Connecticut <laughs> and uh, stopped in Bijou Hills, South Dakota, where my friend Joe Reese lives and stayed with him. He's the one who took the picture of the, the, the pronghorn in the, on the barbed wire fence. But he's from South Dakota, and, and we visited some little remnant prairies there. I just, I've become really attracted to grasslands and the history of how they were used by indigenous people. Apparently, I mean, according to a lot of accounts, they were burned a lot, like almost every year, which created more grassland habitat, which inflated the population of grazing animals, so they had more to eat, like for thousands of years, heavily managed, uh, pr sort of keeps down um, shrubs and, and woody plants. Um, but I don't know, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. I'd have to think more about that. <laughs> I, I like the Arctic. I like. I like treeless areas too, and it'd be fun to spend more time in the Arctic. Thank you for that. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, th thank you very much, Kristen, your whole staff, and all of you who helped make this possible. Thank you.